Welcome. My name is Yvonne Carey, and I'm an instructional specialist with the ICTW. And I'm Jessica Sipovic, training specialist with the ICTW as well. Today, we're going to talk about making work-based learning really work by using task analysis in school and community work settings. So when we're thinking about work-based learning, we really need to keep in mind the goal of that work, and that is competitive integrated employment. So we're talking about real work for real pay, regardless of disability or the needs of accommodation or support. So when we're thinking that and keeping that as our North Star in regards to the work-based learning opportunities we're providing to our students, it's more than just finding a place for them to work and a community business that's willing to open up their doors and let our students come in, but really what, how are we teaching them? What are we teaching them? And how are we making that as efficient, as effective as possible to set them up for that post-secondary employment? I just wanted to point out that task analyses are just one ingredient and one of the many tools that we have in order to make effective instruction really work for kids in the workplace. So today we're going to jump into what are task analyses and how to create them. Task analyses are not a teaching strategy. It's not an instructional strategy. We use task analyses to help us identify subset of skills that we have to teach. So it gives us the blueprint or the map for how we plan instruction. So why do we use task analyses? It really helps us figure out how to plan instruction, what steps are necessary to complete the task, where difficulty may be occurring. So it helps us break down a complex nuanced change task and figure out, oh, the student is having difficulty with steps two, three, and four. Maybe I need to change instruction for that. Gives us this nice sequence for teaching. It helps us figure out in what order we need to teach the steps. And it also helps us figure out if we need to make any modifications to the task or to the environment in order to help the kid be more successful. So how do we create a task analysis? The very first thing we need to do is identify the terminal behavior, which is the objective. So for example, the objective might be for a student to wash their hands 10 out of 10 times correctly according to the steps of a task analysis. In order to figure that out, we would first complete the task ourselves. So I would wash my hands myself and write down the steps that I needed to do in order to complete the task. Each of these steps should be observable and measurable. This means that we must be able to take data on each step. So if somebody came in to watch our instruction or take data with us, they would be able to take data in the same way. We're looking at the same behavior. So we've broken this complex task down into these discrete steps that we're able to take data on each individual step. Then we observe the student perform the task, and this is the most critical step. What we're gonna do is compare our original template that we came up with ourselves to what the student really needs. So we might notice when we go to watch the student perform the task to wash his hands, that he really doesn't know how to pump the soap, how to turn on or off the faucet. So we might have to break that one step down. It took me one step to pump the soap for our student. That might actually be three, four or five steps. Then we confirm the task analysis and we're ready to take data. So we're gonna start by showing you a bad example, which are often very instructive or even more instructive than good examples. So we want you to really think about why this might be a bad example. So keep in mind the critical idea of having these steps being observable and measurable. Can we take data on them? Can we have reliable data on each of these steps? So our first step is wetting hands with hot water. So what might some of the problems be with this step? Is it observable? Is it reliable? Is it measurable? Yeah, Yvonne, when I hear this, I wonder how would I see or know that the, the water is hot? That could also be a potential danger. Hot can be too hot and could hurt someone. And also wet, how do we know if hands are fully wet? Is there a specific degree of wetness we're looking for there? It's a little vague. It is vague. So definitely not observable and measurable. Get enough soap. So this is really problematic. I've worked with kids for whom enough soap is 30 pumps out of a, a dispenser. For other kids, maybe they're just sort of touching the dispenser. So enough is not something I can take data on. 
And from the student's perspective, this isn't clear enough to them. They don't know what enough is. So in this cir circumstance, we might think about quantifying that two pumps of soap um, and really putting a number on that. So enough is, is observable so we can know if there is enough or not, I suppose. That's great. And I can definitely take data on whether a student had two pumps of the soap or not. Cannot take data on whether the student had enough soap or not. Our next step is lather. And this is a really interesting one. I don't know if I would really be able to take data on whether a student is lathering or not. And I'm not sure when we think about um, that might not be a term that everyone's used to using either. So what does it mean to lather your soap? What does it mean? Are we you know, rubbing our hands together till there's suds um, or, you know, creating the bubbles? What is lather? What's what's an appropriate amount of lathering? Um, and, you know, we might get some students that get fixated on that particular step or aren't thorough in that process. So I think there needs to be a little bit more detail in order for me to be able to take the data on it and also make it an effective skill. Great. And our, our second to last one, picking up the towel with the right hand. So obviously this is almost too specific. So what if the student picks up their hand or excuse me, the towel with their left hand? Does that make that step incorrect? So we want to make sure that we're still able to take data, the student is able to perform the task, the step to get the task completed, but we're not so specific that we're locking them into performing in a certain way. And then our last step, throwing the towel away, which is relevant for disposable towels, but not always relevant for non-disposable towels. So again, we want to think about what are the steps that would, we can put in that would help the student succeed with the task, observable or measurable, but not too specific. Agreed. I think all these steps is really important to understand the environment in which you're going to be taking that data in, because if it's a automatic hand dryer, the whole towel thing is thrown out the window, right? So also another thing we just need to take into consideration is the environment in which they're going to be doing these, these steps so we can ensure that it's going to be able to be measured in the moment. Great. So let's take a look at a good example. So these are clearer examples that should be more specific, observable, and measurable. So our first step is approaching the sink. So I can take data on whether somebody's going towards the sink or not, turning on the water, adjusting water temperature as needed, wetting hands, dispensing appropriate amount of soap. So these are steps that are more specific and we can always break them down a little bit more based on student need. So I can think about students I've worked with in the past for whom dispensing the soap into their hands and creating a lather really would be a lot more than just a couple of steps. So for those students, I may even take that section out and create an entire separate task analysis where I'm focusing on those areas that they have difficulty with. And this is where we chunk those specific areas that the student is having difficulty with, and we can create one whole task analysis to meet that. So this is the student, Daniel, who is washing his hands at the community work site, who is having trouble with, you know, putting soap into his hands, creating a lather and rinsing them off. So I was able to break it down even further by observing Daniel and determining that he needed really specific instruction on these areas. So I was able to write down how I was going to dispense the soap, rub hands together, rub palm to palm. So I'm teaching him these specific steps of the task analysis in order for him to be able to complete the task with efficiency. So when we're developing these uh, task analyses, there's a lot of considerations that need to come into play as we illustrated in both our bad and good examples, but there's a lot of student characteristics that we need to take into consideration. Thinking about the individual student that's gonna be completing this task analysis, what works for what task analysis that worked for one student might not work for another. So those are the individualized opportunities where we need to consider the characteristics of the student that we're trying to take that data on. There's also a lot of envi environmental variables. I mentioned just kind of understanding the, the hand dryer versus the towel situation, but also things that we need to take into consideration, loud sounds, 
the lights, the smells, um, different things that might come into play that could impact um, a student's ability to access that task the way that they would in a different environment. And also the specific demands of that task, making sure kind of like that student characteristics that it's appropriate for that student. And also when we're thinking about the task demands, as Yvonne had mentioned earlier, sometimes there are some, there's some opportunity for tasks to not always need to occur in a specific sequence, or sometimes the sequence is very, very specific. So if we're sanitizing dishes in a commercial kitchen, that sequence is non-negotiable, but then there's other steps that might not be mandatory or could occur out of sequence and still the task is completed correctly in the end. And that's really about doing the legwork and the planning process to indicate things that need to occur in a particular sequence or in a certain way and things that have a little bit more room for interpretation. Also, as we had mentioned before, kind of the reason that we chunked out that, that thorough hand scrubbing is that a 30 step task analysis is gonna be very, very challenging to monitor. So thinking about appropriate length, if you're putting something together and it is just building and getting longer and longer, that might be an opportunity to start chunking out specific um, skills or tasks. And then a later you would chain those together, kind of complete an entire task, but breaking it down into smaller steps to make it more, um, accessible. You may have some curriculum or seen some other things where um, you, you'll have commercially available templates for task analysis, prefabbed, already created for you, which are awesome. And we don't need to recreate the wheel, but those are a great starting point. I don't know about you, but there's never been a time where I've opened a piece of um, curriculum or a teaching tool that I was able just to use straight out of the box. So use those as jumping off points and then make the modifications and adaptations you need that suit your particular student and the environment in which you're gonna be um, working with that student. But feel free to use these commercially available templates. Just don't take them as face value and consider what you uh, what sort of modifications might need to be made in order for you to use them effectively in your um, classroom. And then finally, and probably most importantly, um, is thinking about the staff capacity. You are not, as a teacher, may not always be the one that's going to be using that task analysis to take that data. So it needs to be cross-trained with other people. If making sure that they understand each step and know what those steps look like so they can take appropriate data. So that is um, data you can actually use to, to make informed decisions in the future. So really ensuring that everyone on the team is clear, understands the importance, how they're going to take that data, what those skills look like in order to ensure that the, the task analysis is effective and can be used as a really important tool in the community work sites. So this is just a reminder that task analysis is just one ingredient in effective instruction. Um, it is, like I said, not a teaching strategy. It is a way to break down a complex task into discrete steps that you can teach individually. It gives us a map and a blueprint of what to teach, but it doesn't tell you how to teach. The how to teach is systematic instruction strategies, those evidence-based strategies that we know work for students who have severe disabilities. As Yvonne mentioned, this is one tiny little piece to the puzzle, and we have a lot of tools and resources and other webinars available on our website at icdw.illinois.edu. If you scan that QR code, we'd love to add you to our listserv so you can get updates and we have new content available that'll help you build your toolbox for teaching students with disabilities in transition settings. And we look forward to seeing you at a future event. Thanks for joining us.